Welcome to the New York City Church of Christ online service. We're so pleased that you're here to worship with us, to sing, to pray, to hear God's word preached. In John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman about worshiping God. And in verse 21, he says, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The Samaritans really thought that the location of where they worship was the most important thing. Here Jesus really talks about that the location is not as important as the heart of having a spirit and truth. And this passage really encourages me even more because God is actively seeking worshipers. He's not just waiting for people to come to him, but he's looking for worshipers who are worshiping him in, in that way to, to have their hearts connected to him through the spirit and in truth. 37 years ago, my friend Charles shared this scripture with me, and it has been the guiding principle in how I choose to worship every week since then. Today, we climbed up High Tar Mountain in Rockland County because we can oversee all of New York City from this place. And as we are worshiping from our homes, or our couches, or our backyards, or our rooftops, or in a park, we pray that this time is an inspiration to you. Let us pray. God in heaven, your way is perfect. Your word is flawless. You are a shield and our refuge. You strengthen us. You enable us to stand on the heights. Your right hand sustains us. You broaden the path beneath us to make it clearer. You deliver us from trouble and hardship. Please help us to have our minds set on things above as we face what is happening in our country. I pray for the people who have been impacted by the two storms in the Gulf Coast, grieving, loss of friends and family, loss of homes, help the resources to get to the people in need. I pray for those who have been displaced that they can find shelter and necessities. I want to thank you for our brothers and sisters who are healthcare workers Give them stamina and awareness of the needs of their patients. I thank you for our brothers and sisters who are teachers, and as they begin their school year in the midst of uncertainty, give them great patience and their students with their students and the ability to adapt to all the classroom changes. Thank you for our brothers and sisters working in additional essential jobs, especially law enforcement. Thank you for their courage, perseverance, and their light as they serve and protect in the manner of true disciples of Jesus. Give them your love and grace and protect them from harm. As we have seen this week that social and racial injustice continues to plague areas of our country, continuing to harm black men, even though our country's social spotlight has been turned on it, awakening all to its evil and sin. I pray for Jacob Blake, who is recovering. Allow his body to heal so he can walk again and be the father his kids need and want. I also pray for those families who have loved ones that were killed or injured amidst the protesting in Wisconsin. Help them to find your peace as they struggle to understand this injustice. God, we are seeing firsthand how fallen our world has been and continues to become. It is overwhelming, disheartening, and stokes fear and anger in our hearts. We pray for positive change and unified compassion to heal the divide that has been sown that seeks to tear us and our communities apart. I also pray that you will continue to protect us during this pandemic that is still costing hundreds of lives daily throughout this country. As we all have been touched with loss in this church and from this virus, Comfort the many who have lost loved ones. Thank you, God, for loving us with all our flaws. Fill us with faith, hope, and love. 
Help us to freely give those gifts to a hurting world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. And let the glory of the Lord, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. collecting our weekly contribution. As Des and I thought about the call to give cheerfully during such a difficult time for us and many others, we were led to Habakkuk chapter three. Starting in verse 17, the Bible reads, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. I am inspired and challenged by the resolve that Habakkuk has in this passage, and I know it did not come easy. What we learn about Habakkuk in his prayers from earlier chapters is that he saw injustice, he saw pain, he saw a society that did not honor God, and was getting worse and it was all around him and he brought it to God he complained God responded he took issue with God's response he wrestled and struggled with God and at some point in his journey he found a peace and joy in God why 
I believe Habakkuk saw that though all seemed lost, God was not lost. His circumstances told him that there was no food, but God, his God, would be the source of his strength. He knew he would be okay because God was his foundation. And I think when it comes to giving contribution, I get a chance to practice placing my hope in something sure, and that's God. I get a chance to practice rejoicing in God even when I don't necessarily have a smile on my face. So even though I don't know when COVID-19 will go away, what it will be like to go back to school, when racial injustice will end, even though there's political tension everywhere, I will place my trust in God. Yet I will rejoice and give because he is with me through it all. Yeah, this reminds me of the past few months. Uh, there have been times where things have truly felt dark and hopeless from our dream wedding being postponed and reduced to my family's living room, to the racial injustices, the feeling of loss as many have passed away during this time. Times have felt hard and dark. But what I love about Habakkuk is the example he sets and that when things seem hopeless, dark and desolate, that there's still an ability to be joyful and that's through being strengthened by God. I've seen that when I allow myself to be strengthened by God, I truly am able to tread to new heights in my faith and in my response to trials. And this allows me to give back because I know that God has my back. I wanna thank the New York City Church for their incredible generosity for the annual special contribution. Our decision to give will make an incredible impact on so many lives. And next Sunday, September 6th, our church service will be combined with some of our sister churches in Africa, and we will all get a chance to worship God together. Let's pray for our weekly offering. Our Father in heaven, God, thank you so much for providing for us. And God, sometimes, even if it may be little, God, I pray that we can rejoice in everything that you give to us, God. Mm -hmm. Father, allow us to give at this time when we don't feel like we have much. Father, give us the energy and strength to love when we don't feel loved, Father. Allow us to look at you and realize that you are beyond our circumstances and to find our strength, peace, and comfort in you. Please be with us, Father. Be with our contribution. Multiply it and help it to meet the needs of those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Jesus, he gave a water. water. He gave a water. Oh, my Jesus, he gave a water. He gave a water. Oh, Jesus, he gave a water. He gave a water. He gave the water, and it was not from the well. There was a woman he gave a water. from Samaria. He gave a water. Came to the well. He gave a water. He gave a water. He gave a water. Oh, there he gave she a water. met a stranger. He gave a water. He I'm John Markowski with the Manhattan Region, also known as the Big Apple Church. 
And as you know, we're all here in our English speaking service in the New York Church, but there's also a simulcast for our Spanish speaking brothers and sisters happening right now. So I do want to say to them, Bienvenidos a todos, mi hermanas y hermanos latinos también. It is great to be together worshiping God online. And before I go any further, I do want to make sure that I acknowledge that many of us right now are most likely hurting and heavy hearted as we learned of the shooting of Jacob Blake, a young man of color in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm very grateful to our elder Mark Sanders for praying earlier for healing and for peace, and will continue to do so. I know we're all looking to God for answers during these disturbing times. And I want to ask that we all turn our Bibles right now to Isaiah chapter 64. We're going to continue to go to God and His Word for guidance. If you're like me, 2020 has been a very different kind of year than you might have had vision for. And it's hard to believe that it'll be September in a couple of days. That's like mind-boggling. And I do have to say I'm very excited to worship with our African brothers and sisters next week because that'll be our Labor Day weekend service. And so because of that, we wanted to share a few Labor Day related thoughts in this service today ahead of the upcoming holiday. And actually, I didn't realize this, but the first Labor Day parade happened right here in New York City, uh, celebrating the contributions of American workers, honoring hard work, as we see all over the Bible, right here in 1 Thessalonians 5.12 is no different. And we do have hundreds of essential workers online with us right now. And I just want to say on behalf of the church how grateful we are for your tireless efforts and service, especially these last few months. You know, there's an expression uh, around this topic and theme and word, labor. Sometimes you, you hear people say it. It's a labor of love. Have you ever heard of that saying? Uh, if you have and you know what it is, uh, please write in the chat uh, your own personal definition. Let's see what you got. Uh, let's open up the Webster's of the mind. Don't Google it and just give it your best. Throw it in the chat. What is a labor of love? And we'll start reading that in a minute. And we'll keep going. So maybe you've said this phrase when you're working on something super challenging, and you, but you enjoyed the work. It was difficult, but you were proud of the results. You called it a labor of love. Okay, I see we're getting some good answers here in the chat. Um, now, one definition says that a labor of love is a productive work performed voluntarily without material reward or compensation. Now, I'm guessing that might be how a lot of moms feel in the aftermath of childbirth. You know, that it is super challenging, uh, a lot of work, did it voluntarily. No, I'm not getting paid for it. It was definitely a labor of love. I am a literal labor of love to my mom. My mom actually went into labor with me on Labor Day. I wasn't born in a hospital. My parents were hippies. Uh, they wanted to give birth to me at home. So mom was in the backyard walking around. Uh, contractions came. She walked into the living room, sat on a chair, and gave birth to me uh, right here in this house on the right side window just beyond that place is where I happened. And uh, she definitely wasn't getting paid for it. In fact, there wasn't even money for a crib. So first few years of my life, I lived in a cardboard box. Maybe that's why I love New York City so much. I got used to small spaces at a young age. I'm not sure. Uh, but let's continue to look at this phrase, labor of love in a spiritual context. So here it is. In Isaiah 64, verse 8, we get a perspective on God. It says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Here we see that we're a labor of love to God. God is the potter and we are the clay. Maybe he tells the angels this is a labor of love. Let's turn over to Jeremiah chapter 18. We're going to land in this text and uh, really pick it apart and discover a little bit more about this analogy uh, in Jeremiah 18. And as you're turning over there, I want to show you, you know, I made my own little clay creations back in elementary school, uh, growing up in Syracuse, New York, upstate. Uh, this is my first creation. Uh, it's a little coffee tea mug here, and it's quite a, a wide base, uh, not too tall. And uh, I got my, my JM initials on there, so everyone would know that I did this. And 
I was pretty proud of it. Uh, it's got a couple of issues, kind of uh, cracking down there at the bottom. I had some problems with the, uh, the handle here. And basically the biggest thing I learned is that you can always mold soft clay. But if you want to make changes when it hardens, it's really difficult and it might crack. And basically what happened is that handle did crack. I don't know how close I can get in there, but you can see that kind of like hairline fracture uh, and eventually the handle popped off. So we can't use this uh, as a cup or a mug. It's not functional in that way because it will most likely fall apart. So I learned uh, my lesson and my second creation was this beautiful vase. Vase you say? It doesn't look like a vase looks more like alien obelisk but it is a vase i'll explain there's my initials again nice and smooth uh got the hole there where you put in the flowers and uh, actually um i learned here you know i kept it more moist as i was creating the vase and uh, had it totally shaped until it was absolutely ready for the kiln so i could have it in the shape i wanted of course the vase used to be much bigger it could carry a lot of flowers but as i kept working and carving it got smaller and smaller now it is a single flower base. <laughs> it, it's uh, just, just big enough for one. And that's probably what it was meant to be this whole time. See, God is a potter. He has the master skills. Unlike an elementary kid, uh, he knows what he's doing. He sees the final vision of what he is shaping in all of us. And here in Jeremiah 18, the passionate prophet Jeremiah got some further instruction about this uh, illustration. Let's read together Jeremiah 18, starting in verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. You know, here God commands Jeremiah to learn a lesson, an analogy from real life. And this happens all the time, where we learn spiritual lessons from our physical reality. Whether you're cooking in the kitchen or playing ball in the basketball court or having dinner with roommates or family, God is always shaping and molding us as the potter on his wheel. So Jeremiah probably went down to the lower part of the city in the Valley of Hinnom to see the potter on his wheel. And there's two really fascinating Hebrew words that I wanna break down for you right now that I think will help us understand the context even better. The first word for the word potter is yatsar. Let's all say that together, yatsar. Ooh, very good, I hear those Hebrew accents coming through. Uh, this word yatsar uh, can also mean maker or former or shaper. It's a parallel to the word bara in the first words of the creation of Genesis. In the beginning, he berashit, from bara, for created. So the potter is more than just someone that works with clay. He's a shaper, a molder, a former, a visionary. The other word I want to go through with you is the word for wheel. This word is eben. Let's all say it together. Eben. Very good. It's pretty easy. It's from the word for stone in ancient Hebrew. But it's a dual here, so it actually literally translates to two stones or two wheels because the potter's tool was a two stone wheel spinning mechanism you got the foot stone that spins on the bottom and then that spins the top shaping stone for the clay sometimes from this context i imagine god on his two stone wheel his ebonim spinning the whole earth with his foot and shaping us with his hands but what happens as jeremiah is watching the potter the yatsar well in verse 4 it says the pot that he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter had to form it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. So to close out the message today, we've got two points from the potter. They are messed up and made right. Messed up and made right. Because like clay, we can get messed up, but God can always make it right. So point number one, messed up. See, Jeremiah sees a classic situation on the potter's stone. The clay gets marred. It gets messed up. It has to be reformed. Uh, that, in verse 4 in the NIV, we got the word marred. In the original Hebrew, that word can also be corrupted 
or polluted, spoiled in some way. You know, sin can corrupt our human clay. And in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, it says that we can be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, the waters of baptism can keep us soft-hearted, but it's up to us to make our election sure, to stay humble, to stay moldable. As Al said last week, when he was quoting the Sermon on the Mount, to be poor in spirit, meaning that we're an empty vessel for God to fill with his stuff, not for us to fill with ours. You know, you can't mold hard clay. We learned that in my elementary school uh, exercise a few minutes ago. The question for us as Christians is, are we still moldable? Are we still teachable? Or have the years of our faith actually puffed up our pride? Have we become a one-way Christian? What do you mean, John? What is a one-way Christian? Well, that's where discipling can only go one way. From you to others, but not from others to you. That's hard clay. That's a hard heart. And here the Hebrew writer is digging in. He's saying, you know, we are hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Well, how is sin deceptive? A lot of ways. Well, one of the ways is sin promises happiness, but it can't deliver. It, it, it says, you know, if I drink this amount of alcohol, then I'll be happy. If I just have this relationship with that person, then I'll be happier. If I just watch this thing or buy that thing, then I'll be content. If then, fill in the blank. But that's like a broken mirror. It's not a trustworthy picture of real life. The broken mirror has promised that we'll feel better even if we give in to our rage and just give full vent to our anger about how messed up our world is. We might be right in our assessment of how messed up it is, but we could, we could be wrong in the way that we react to it. And you know, the devil, he smells blood in the water like a shark. He finds our Achilles heel. He puts that, that right post in your feed that just drives you nuts. The perfect trigger word in a conversation that gets you going and boils your blood. Or maybe even something is said on the live chat or, or in the news or in an email. And then all of a sudden we've taken the bait and sin gives birth to death. We get hooked. We get dragged down, deceived by sin. We've all been there. But the good news about God the potter is he says, like in Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. We can still have a soft heart. You know, there's a young man by the name of Paul uh, living in Lebanon. He was going down that same road. He, he didn't know God. He was living his own way on his own terms. And then all of a sudden, he got into a major car accident. Almost every bone in his body was broken. And that's just the crazy thing about tragedy is you never think it'll happen to you until it happens to you. He was messed up. He was messed up in every way. He was messed up physically, messed up emotionally, definitely messed up spiritually. And he made a promise. He made a promise in a prayer to God that if he was saved, that he would soften his heart and let himself be molded. And God heard him. And he made Jesus Lord of his life. And he was baptized. And he's our brother in Christ in the Beirut church at this moment. You know, the one thing the potter never does is throw away the clay. God wasn't done with Paul. Even though the clay was marred, polluted, spoiled, and it seemed like you should just get rid of it and go with a different set of clay. But no, that's not what God did. He was messed up, but made right. Which leads to my second point. Point number two made right. We could be messed up, but then made right. That's our story. In Jeremiah 18 and verse 4, it says that the potter reforms the clay, that he shapes it as seems best to him. You know, imagine Jeremiah's surprise. You know, he's, he's hearing this, he's seeing this analogy, he's down at the potter's house, you know, he's understanding, oh, okay, I get it, we're like clay, you're giving Israel another shot, but look, Lord, why? Maybe it's time that you don't give Israel another shot. And God says, nope, as long as there's clay to shape, I'm going to put in the work to make it right. You know, on August 4th, earlier this month, there was an explosion in Beirut. Hundreds were killed. Thousands were injured. And our friend Paul that we just shared about a minute ago worked in a restaurant in the blast site. And when he came to his senses after the explosion, he did what disciples of Jesus do in crisis. He got busy helping others. 
But as he's running from person to person, someone grabbed him and said, no, you need help. He was soaked in blood. And it wasn't others' blood, it was his. A shard of glass had hit his liver and he was bleeding out. You know, shock does weird things to the body. And so he, he takes the advice of this stranger and, and starts to, to walk towards a hospital. He gets a hold of his brother, says, let's, let's meet at this place. I need your help. I need to get to a hospital. I'm bleeding out. I think I'm going to die. And of course, they get to the hospital. It's overloaded. It's overwhelmed with all the people that were injured, the dying. And there's no room. And so he turns to his brother and he says, I'm at peace. I can die. It reminded him, in contrast to the accident three years earlier, then he had fear, fear dominating his heart and his mind, fear of the unknown. But now he was sure, he was sure of one thing, and that was his relationship with God. And he was willing to bet his life on it. You know, for some, it is their time. And even recently, we grieve the loss of many of our loved ones. But in that moment, it wasn't time for Paul. God still had some shaping to do. And it's an amazing story because he's recovering now from his wounds and he continues to go out and serve, volunteer with Hope Worldwide and do his best to make a difference. You know, Paul got centered and then recentered, And that's what potters do. When, when they get the clay on the stone, they center that clay. They press it down. They put a lot of pressure and they make sure that it's completely balanced. Isn't that God? God is constantly trying to center us, you know, get us balanced. He puts that pressure on and helps us so that we're ready to go and balanced for the spiritual path. In Isaiah 30 and verse 21, it says, whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. You know, whether you're a student or an employee or an employer and unemployed or retired, the COVID calendar is completely built on uncertainty. I mean, we, we know nothing. We are learning things all the time. Uh, when schools are, are going to be back in session and what that's going to look like and blended learning and remote learning, uh, back to the office, is that even possible? Gyms opening up, there's a big debate about that. Restaurants and movies and how long am I supposed to quarantine if I travel and how do I get a test? And all that's different now because then you look again and they ups, updated the website two seconds ago and all the information changes. It's constantly shifting. And then we hear, Loads of information, loads of information, telling us this, telling us that, to our right, to our left. And th this is not a political verse, but even now in an election season with tensions high, when all the voices get loud, drawing us into a particular worldview, as children of God, we got to clear the airwaves and listen to his voice, which says, this is the way, walk in it. It's the kingdom worldview centered on Jesus Christ. In Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 9 in the New Living, it says, What sorrow awaits those who argue with their Creator? Does a clay pot argue with its Maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, Stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot exclaim, How clumsy can you be? <laughs> can you imagine the scene? The, the clay throwing shade back at the potter? Now nah, you're squeezing me too hard. Now nah, I need more water. I'm dizzy. Stop spinning. That is ridiculous, right? You gotta love some of these ridiculous passages that help paint a picture. There's no benefit in arguing the potter. There's definitely no use in comparing ourselves with other pots, other shapes. You know, why don't I have a handle like that other picture? You know, I don't like being a little cup. I wanna be a salad bowl. You know, we can get that way. Why am I broke? Why am I, why am I tempted by this particular thing? Why am I stuck? I, I wanna be healthy like her, handsome like him, wealthy like them. You know, are you saying that you know better than God? Are you trying to tell the potter how to do his job? Like the verse says, what sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? And then there's some of us that feel broken. You know, wondering, is it, is it too late for me? Am I broken beyond compare? Have I hardened past God's ability to mold me? Well, I know what I've seen. And I've seen God take shattered men and women like Paul in our story, like, like me, like you, and make them to even a more beautiful creation. You know, there's a long-standing artistic tradition in Japan called kintsugi. My friend Mark told me about it a while back. A 15th century shogun broke a tea bowl, and he wasn't going to throw it away. That would be a waste. And so he sent the bowl away for repairs. 
But when it came back, it was ugly, it had these metal staples in it. And instead of getting rid of it or critiquing it, Kintsugi was born, which is this way of using gold to fix the broken pottery. They use gold dust and lacquer, creating glistening seams in the broken creations. So no longer are these broken pots mistakes, they're marks of unique beauty. Kintsugi is actually Japanese for golden repair. See, we're all clay in the master's hands. Thank God that he doesn't throw us away. And sin hardens us. Sometimes even we suffer in brokenness. But if we come humble, he carefully seams us back together with the golden repair. And that leaves not the scars of mistakes and regret, but the marks of unique growth and beautiful healing. You know, we just had an amazing virtual teen and preteen camp with some incredible messages. And what are some of the most memorable parts of those messages? It's our stories of being broken and being put back together again with God's gold. You know, our stories that were messed up but made right, that Jesus died, the human clay of his body, broken for us, and by his broken parts, we are healed. His sacrifice becomes the golden repair of our souls. The potter isn't done with you yet. Your life is clay, yet to be shaped. And no matter how messed up we may feel, the potter can always make it right. Let's pray at this time for the communion. Our Father in heaven, uh, great potter, Yatsar at your ebonim, carving and shaping and spinning the world, we, we honor you at this time as creator, as shaper, as molder in charge. And we want to come to you with all of our feelings right now. We, we are unsettled by how messed up the world is and, and how messed up we are. And we beg you to intervene and make it right, to make things right as, as you have since the beginning of creation. Father, we invite you into our lives right now. We soften our hearts and ask you to shape us, to center us. Because these jars of, of clay feel real tired right now. So we're asking you for, for energy as we come into a new season, into September, for renewed devotion to you, to repentance and to growth, to use your goal to mend our broken parts. And Father, we ask that as that happens, as we grow, that you receive all the glory for the stories that we tell about how you save us through the death of your Son. We remember Jesus now, his death for a messed up world, and the resurrection that made it right and guides us now. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, you are able to bind up the broken heart. Jesus, you are able to bind up the broken-hearted people. Jesus, you are able to bind up the
you have taken all my guilt and sin upon your body. Jesus, you Thanks everyone for joining us uh, and worshiping with us this morning. Thank you, John, for encouraging us with God's word. We want to encourage you to connect with us at nyccoc.net slash connect. And if you were encouraged by today's message or encouraged by the singing or anything at all in our worship, we want to encourage you to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. Now let's take a moment to welcome those who recently became members of our church. One, two, three. <laughs>so encouraging to see God's Spirit moving and to see men and women getting baptized and restored. Uh, welcome to our fellowship and uh, this is going to be one there's going to be one final song one to encourage you to stick around and also we'll see you next Sunday same time same place. God bless you. Hail, hail, line of Judah. 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 Hail, line of Judah. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. Line of Judah, I love thee. Line of Judah, I love thee. Because you died upon a tree. Because you died upon a tree Way back up on Calvary Way back up on Calvary Thank you God for loving me Thank you God for loving me Now hail, hail, line of Judah Hail, hail, line of How glorious you are In my sins, my life was dead In my sins, my life was dead I often did not use my head I often did not use my head So I picked up the Bible and I read 
picked up the Bible that I read. All the things that Bible said. I did all the things that Bible said. Oh! 